and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Dave Ramsey. A good plan, violently executed, now, is better than a perfect plan, executed later. General George Patton. If you're going to go into battle, you need a plan. If you're going to win a football game, you need a game plan. And that's what we're doing tonight with you guys here in the room and those 40,000 or so of you watching around the world. Thank you for joining us. This is all about putting together a game plan. It turns out that after all these years of running a business now with about 1,000 folks on our team, which is 1,000 opportunities for somebody to be pissed off at each other, <laughs> after trying to put together strategies for Ramsey this and Ramsey that and trying to understand how all this business stuff works and studying really successful people in history and getting to know some really successful people. It turns out that as I watch people go from nothing to baby steps millionaires, none of them say it was an accident. <laughs> Success was an accident. They never go up to the guy at the end of the Super Bowl and the confetti's going off, and the little reporter runs out and says, so what happened? He says, I have no idea. I just got off the bus, and this just happened. Winning at anything is not an accident. And in most cases, it is a violently executed plan that is somewhat imperfect, but by God, you did it. You stepped up, you punched it in the nose, and you took your life by the ears and said, you're going to behave. A violently executed plan, a plan executed with passion and belief that causes you to sacrifice to win because nobody really wins without sacrifice. I mean, all those times you bought a lottery ticket and didn't win and then you got one that won, that was all the sacrifice. And that seems somewhat random and it is somewhat random and it's pretty much stupid. But even when you win at something like that, it's not as random as much of a lightning strike as you feel like it is. Winning is a series of behaviors, habits, decisions, implementations, the cumulative effect of a life well lived. We had a couple on the air today on the Ramsey Show that did their debt free scream. 75 years old, been married 50 years. You don't stay married 50 years without her killing you. Unless you learn something along the way, you got progressively better. You get prog That's somebody you want to interview on how to be married in a culture that can't seem to figure this thing out. They can't seem to get married, then they can't seem to stay married. Man, that's a study, best practices study, people that are winning. So with the right plan, your life can change. And you'd be amazed at how much it can change in just 90 days. I mean, you can really violently execute the plan, and within 90 days, you're going to see a big thing change. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is with us tonight. He's going to be talking to you folks about goals and how to put them in place, how to implement them, and call, how to win. Christy's going to be talking from her brand new number one best-selling book. We found out today was a number one, Take Back Your Time, and, and how, to, how to handle your time, how to own that stuff. And, and then I'm going to come up and we're going to do a few minutes on how to have a game plan, of course, on your money. I don't know anything about anything else. <laughs> and uh, live stream, we want to hear from you guys. We want to know in the comments section uh, what you think the number one thing that you have to do with money is if you want to win. What's the number one thing you do if you want to win? Put it in the comments section in the live stream. So our first speaker tonight, Ramsey personality, George Camel, is absolutely incredible. He is a, the, the host of the Entree Leadership podcast, which if you're not listening to and you're in business or leadership or have any interest in it, you should be. It's absolutely phenomenal. I listened to it on my walk this morning. It was really, really good. And also a brand new Ramsey Network podcast that is 
Uh, <laughs> doing exactly what we hoped it would do. It's really ticking off some people. <laughs> the bad people that are ripping people off, they don't like George. <laughs> and they don't like the fine print. You ever, see, you ever heard somebody say, read the fine print? Make sure you read the fine print? Well, you should have. Because that's when you get screwed, right? And George has got about 10 episodes in the can with the fine print. It's a wonderful new podcast on the Ramsey Network. Be sure you check it out. And he knows this money piece, and he knows this Ramsey way of life inside and out. We're so proud to have him as a Ramsey personality. Please welcome him to the stage, George Camel. All right. How many of you have failed at a goal in the last 18 months? Show of hands. Ma'am, you didn't have your hand up. You've accomplished all of your goals. You, know, you should be up here, not me. <laughs> Show us your ways. This is very impressive. Let me guess. Pandemic? It's a pretty good excuse. I'm not going to lie. Uh, same here. Same here. I've failed at a lot of goals uh, in the past. Let me take you back to December 2013. It was a simpler time, wasn't it? Harkening back to December 2013. Old George had a lot of goals, or I guess it was technically younger George, but it was an older time. Old younger George had a lot of aspirational goals for the year 2014, right? High expectations for myself. I thought, this is my year. New year, new me, baby. Let's go. I even had a word for the year. Y'all know about these word for the year things? You get your little theme. So in 2012, my word was live. In 2013, my year my word was laugh. And in 2014, my word was? No, it wasn't love. It was persevere. How'd you guys not? <laughs> Live, laugh, persevere. That's how the saying goes. Anyways, I had 35 goals in all kinds of areas of life, and I was super excited. I had my iPhone note ready to go. Game on. Let's do this thing. One of my goals was to read 52 books in a year. The previous year, I read one. So it was a little aspirational, all things considered. <laughs> I also said I was going to work out three times a week. And let me tell you, what it takes to get this body is working out zero times a week. <laughs> so I had big goals. I was ready to go. Week one, crushed the book. I was on track. And I went to the gym a few times that week. I was doing great. Week two, things slowed down a little bit. I read an audio book. Yes, you can do that. <laughs> at one and a half speed. Crushed that. And I went on a walk. So we'll count that. That's a win. But week three, things derailed. It wasn't even February yet, and I was Googling to see if spark notes were still a thing, <laughs> and my workout was taking out the trash. It was a heavy load in my defense, but still, I had failed, right? I joined the 92% of people who never achieved their New Year's goals, which is normal, right? Average. University of Scranton found that 92% of people never achieved their New Year's goals. It's why January 1st, the gym is packed, you can't get in, and by Valentine's Day, there's a Stairmaster for miles, right? You don't have to do a Dateline investigation to figure out what happened here. People had weak goals. They had unclear motivation, they had a vague plan, and they didn't develop habits to help them get there. That was me. And I'm sure we've all been there. For the longest time, I just thought, I'm just not wired for goals right? It's for a certain type of person. It's for the Dave Ramseys and the Christie Wrights who just get up and just attack the day, and they wake up at 5 a.m., and they have their quiet time, and they go and run, and they help out of the nursing home on the weekends, and they have great, deep relationships. Their marriages are incredible. They read thousands of books a year, and it's just not in the cards for me. What about goals for the rest of us, for the average, everyday people who can't just crush it and charge hell with a water pistol, right? I needed something more than that. But here's what I know about goals. We are all designed for personal growth. Every human on this earth is designed to grow. But we're also prone to failure and apathy and laziness and Oreos and shame and guilt and frustration and distractions. The list goes on. And what George of 2013 didn't know was that he was a few crayons short of a full box when it came to goal setting, right? I didn't have the full picture. But in the last eight years here at Ramsey, I have learned so much from Dave Ramsey, from Christy Wright, from the Entree Leadership Team, from our principals, and I actually achieved a whole bunch of goals, especially in the area of money. In those eight years, I paid off $36,000 of student loan debt. I paid off $4,000 of credit card debt and became completely debt-free. 
I started saving for emergencies. I started investing for the future. And I thought, okay, I guess I can accomplish goals. But you need a secret sauce, and I'm excited to share that with you tonight. Me and my wife, uh, she works here, by the way. We met here. It's a beautiful love story. That's for another time. We had a BHAG. That's a big, hairy, audacious goal to pay off our house. And we didn't want to do it in 30 years, like the average American, if they're lucky. We didn't want to do it in 15 years. In 2019, when we moved into that house, we said, we're going to pay this thing off in three years. That is a big, hairy, audacious goal, and it scared me a little bit. And a good goal should scare you a little bit. And I'm so excited to announce that in six months, we will have a paid-for house in our early 30s. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We're not special, we're not rich, we're not masterminds, we just followed a proven process and we got a handle on what it takes to achieve a goal. And that's what I wanna to talk to you guys today about when I wanna do it through the lens of debt payoff because America is broke. And one of my goals in life is to help them get a little more unbroke. Okay, I just invented that word tonight. And here's what it takes. There are three keys to setting goals and seeing success. The first key is to know your why. Know your why. Why are you doing this? You need to create a vision for your life. Before you set any goals, you've got to have a vision. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And now, I don't know a lot of old-timey language, so I looked up what the word perish means. To die or be destroyed, especially in a violent or untimely manner. Dang, Bible. Why so serious? The Bible literally says, if you don't have a vision, you're roadkill. Splat. You've got to have a vision. You've got to have a huge why and a vision behind your goal because that's going to give you a real reason to do it. That's going to be the engine that fuels this thing. So ask yourself, where are you going and why are you going there? And that why, whew, that can open a whole can of worms because a lot of times you'll realize you've got real bad motivations. You're trying to keep up. You're trying to do it for the gram. You're trying to cover up insecurities. You're trying to perform and please others. That is a bad plan. We need good motivations. We need big whys. I heard someone on our debt-free screams today. I want to change my family tree. I want to leave a different legacy. I want to retire early. I want to give outrageously. I want to lead a healthy life and be able to play with my grandkids. Those are good motivations. And if you want a good motive and you want a big enough why, you need to attach a so that to your goals. I didn't make this up. One of the taglines for this place is live like no one else so that later you can live and give like no one else. You all memorized it. And you may not know that so that is really important. That is the vision. That is the why. You got to have a bigger picture for your life, the picture of the person you want to become, your future self. And if you want to take this a step deeper, there's this new thing out there that's really cool, and it's called identity-based goals. And James Clear talks about this in his book, Atomic Habits. And here's what it says. Don't focus on performance. Don't focus on accomplishments and achievements. Focus on the person that you want to become, the person you're becoming. Identity-based goals tap into a deep motivation that will transform you. Transformation is way deeper than just achieving a goal. James Clear says you need to decide who you want to be and then take small steps to get there. You know, small steps, that kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Kind of reminds me of baby steps. I think Dave Ramsey's onto something. This thing just might work. So as you're considering which goals to set, ask yourself why you want to achieve this goal. Decide what kind of person you want to be and attach a so that to make it powerful. And then you can start to become the type of person who says no to debt, who pays cash for things who eats healthy, who works out regularly. Now, we got to be realistic here. I'm not going to become Dwayne The Rock Johnson because I shave my head and get a spray tan and start working out a lot, right? I can't become 6'2". The doctor says there's still hope. I'm 92% there, just math-wise. One of my favorite bands, the Aver Brothers, they have a lyric that says this, decide what to be and go be it. And a lot of times we overcomplicate goals. We have excuses, but that's really what it comes down to. Once we have that powerful why, then we can move on to step two, which is make a plan. Dave Ramsey says, goals are visions and dreams with work clothes on. And now it's time to get to work. 
You need to have goals in these areas. We call it the wheel of life coined by the great Zig Ziglar. You've got to have goals that are in the physical realm, intellectual, career, social, financial, family, and spiritual. Picture this wheel as the wheel of a bicycle. And there's spokes within each wheel. And if one of those spokes becomes weak or becomes damaged, you get what's called a flat tire. And that's dangerous, that's inefficient, because when your life gets unbalanced, it's really unhealthy, right? If you never skip leg day, but you skip all of your kids' soccer practices, you become a really strong dude and a really weak dad. And let me tell you, I don't have kids yet, but I skip leg day all the time. (laughs) And I get it, parents. I know what you go through because I am a dog dad, okay? So I'm on the right track with this dad stuff. So if you want to have goals that work, they have to be five things. A good goal must be specific, must be measurable, must have a time limit, must be yours, and must be in writing. So let's unpack these. These are non-negotiables for a good goal. So one and two, specific and measurable. You want to lose weight? Wonderful. You want to pay off debt? Great. That's not a goal. How much? Give me a number. $36,000. Great. Now we're cooking with gas. We've got that. Now we got to figure out when. You want to lose weight? You want to pay off debt? Great. When do you want to do that? Two years. All right. Now we have a time limit. And now here's what happens. Sixth grade math starts to kick in. And you don't need to know the Pythagorean theorem. It's just basic basic division. We've got to reverse engineer this goal. We've got to do some backwards planning to figure out what this is going to take. I want to pay off $36,000 of debt in two years. Great. Now we can do some math. That's $18,000 a year. That's $1,500 a month. That's $346 a week. Now, some of you are saying, George, that's great. Math is wonderful, but I don't have an extra $1,500 a month to pay off debt. Settle down. Dave Ramsey's going to be up here momentarily, and he's going to show you the game plan to actually get there and how to create that margin in your life through budgeting and all kinds of things. So divide out what it takes to get to where you want to go. Me and my wife did this. Before we ever owned a home, we were still in our apartment, we would jump on the Ramsey Mortgage Payoff Calculator. And we'd start to dream up, hey, what is this going to take mathematics-wise to pay off our house early? Oh, it's going to take thousands of extra dollars a month towards our mortgage, which means we've got to create a lot of margin. So you've got to figure out what it takes to get there. Number four, the goal must be yours. Not your mom's, not your wife's, especially not your mother-in-law's. Listen, you married her baby. You are never going to be good enough for her, okay? Don't do this. Do a goal because it's yours, because it's birthed out of your visions and your dreams. You've got to own this thing. Number five, the goal must be in writing. Goals aren't goals until they're written down, right? You've got to type it out, write it out. Maybe you hang it up uh, underneath your rearview mirror in your car. Maybe you put it on your bathroom mirror. Maybe you hang it beneath your live, laugh, persevere sign in your kitchen. <laughs> do whatever you've got to do, but you've got to be able to see this goal regularly to remind yourself and remind yourself of the why. Dr. Gail Matthews is a psychology professor at Dominican University in California, and she did a study on this and found that you're 42% more likely to achieve your goal just by writing it down. So there you go. There's your life hack for the day. Write down your goal, and you are halfway closer to getting there. Here's a shameless plug for Christy Wright's 2022 Goal Planner, which you can get right now if you want to really go deeper into this, and also a shameless plug for my product that was not released, George Camel's Dream Journal. That one died on the cutting room floor. Dave Ramsey did a hard nope on that. I thought it had potential, just saying. Now, you might be thinking, all right, seven areas, I got to have goals in each. How the heck do you do this? How do I still have a life? How do I balance this all? How do I prioritize? Well, Christy Wright's going to be up here in a little bit to walk you through how to do just that. So I'm real excited for that. We've got to get clear on this plan. They've got to have those five things. We've got to have goals in all of these areas so we don't get a flat tire. Otherwise, it's still a wish. And the third piece we need, the third part that I often didn't do, which is why I never achieved my goals, was change your habits. You've got to change your habits. We don't need more information. I can Google everything in the palm of my hand. I know how to get skinny. I just don't want to do it. I mean, I'm personally skinny, but for all of you out there who want to do that, I can give you the magic formula to that. And getting skinny is one thing, but how do you stay skinny, right? That's a lifestyle change. That takes a lot of hard actions and hard pivots. It means eating things like kale chips. 
Why would they put the word chips after kale? That should be illegal. And don't get me started on cauliflower steak. Who decided cauliflower can be so many things? You can't just cut it up and grill it and call it a steak. Where's the beef? I want to know where the beef is. This is unbelievable. This is a lie from the pit of hell. Anyways, back to habits. James Clear defines habits like this. Habits are small decisions you make, actions you perform every day. And researchers at Duke University found that habits account for 40% of our behaviors, which means your life today is essentially the sum of your habits, good or bad. Some of you have great ones. Some of you need to break some. Some of you need to create some. We've got to create these smaller, consistent habits to help us achieve our goals, right? That's why we have the baby steps. They're small, incremental steps you can take. So if you want to create a habit of saving, you might need to change a habit of spending. If you want to lose weight, you might need to break up with Ben and Jerry, right? I know it's double hard. You've got Ben and Jerry. It's a double breakup. Don't worry. They'll be okay. They'll find another lover, and you will find love again. I believe in you. This man is shaking his head. No, I will not find love again. Ben and Jerry are my soulmates. I respect that. What I found is that, you know, we teach a lot about investing around here, and we talk about compound interest. When your money makes money over time, it's a long game. And habits are the same way. Habits compound, I found, right? If you go out to eat one time, you're not going to go broke. You go out to eat every single day, you will get broke in a month. And if you eat one slice of pizza, you'll be okay. You're not going to get fat, but eat pizza every day for a month, and you will. It's amazing how that works, compound habits. One of the biggest reasons I failed at my goals personally is that I was so focused on the finish line. I was so focused on the outcome, and I got tripped up. You see, goals are what you get. This is the outcome. But I think we need to flip this whole thing on its head. I think we're doing it backwards. What we need to focus on first is our vision, our identity, and our why, what we believe. And then we can move into the processes, the systems that are going to get us there, what we do. This is the habits. And guess what happens when you got those two and you actually form those habits? You get outcomes and you achieve your goals. Once I realized that, it changed everything for me. I was so focused on the goal itself and I was ignoring the why, I was ignoring the vision, the identity, I was ignoring the processes and systems it would take to get there. F.M. Alexander says it this way, people do not decide their futures. They decide their habits and their habits decide their futures. That'll preach. Goals involve behavior change. That's what I found. People don't talk about that. It just sounds fun to do goals. What they're saying is change. That's what it is. That's really hard because it's way easier to go through the Chick-fil-A drive-thru than it is to go home, grocery shop, and meal prep, right? It is their pleasure to serve me at the Chick-fil-A drive-thru. <laughs> meal prepping is no one's pleasure. No one gets pleasure out of that, right? And psychologists, Don Kelly and Daryl Connor, they came, came up with this emotional cycle of change that is fascinating. And I'm going to run through this idea of debt payoff. There's five stages to this. It starts with uninformed optimism. This is where you watch a debt-free scream, and you go, oh, babe, we could, we, we could do that. We could, we could be debt-free. We're going to go to Nashville and scream on the debt-free stage. It's going to be awesome. This is the most exciting stage. You've imagined all of the benefits and experienced none of the costs. You've got a year's supply of rice and beans. You've got gazelle intensity. Your alarm clock is just Dave Ramsey yelling at you. You are fired up. You are ready to go. But that phase is short-lived, unfortunately, and you move into informed pessimism. This is where you learn the reality of what it takes to change. You start to question if it's worth it. Oh, gosh, we got to cut the sports channels. we got to cut cable. we got to stop eating out. we got to start doing this budgeting thing. I can't... I have to skip brunch with the boys? Are you kidding me? This is hard. This is the part where you realize that it takes some sacrifice to change. And then as you continue down, you enter the valley of despair. This is a dark place to be. This is where you start to cuss. And if you've got a spouse, that cuss word might be Dave, right? <laughs> it's a four-letter word. It works. And it's less salty than some other words. But this is where you start to go like, I don't know if it's worth it. I'm going to give up. I'm going to quit. This is when most people quit their goals. It's too hard to get out of the slump. They go back to square one. They get deflated, you feel shame, you feel guilt, you go, of course you failed, you always fail, you'll never achieve your goals. 
This is just like you, isn't it? And you go, yeah, it is. I'm going to go eat some Oreos and wallow, right? This is most of America. This is how we treat goals. But if you power through this and you realize, I'm going to get back up. Failure is okay. I can do this thing. I can budget. You get to informed optimism. This is where you see some light at the end of the tunnel and you realize it's not an oncoming train. This thing just might work out. You start to get a little more excited. You start to see the power of the debt snowball, and you start to actually budge and go, oh my gosh, we, we can create margin. We have money left over. And once you do that, you get to success. This is the part we all dream about. This is the debt-free scream on the stage right above me. You realize the cost of change is worth it, and the actions that were once uncomfortable are now routine. So here's what I want to tell you about the cycle of change. Know that it's coming. There are no shortcuts. You don't just get to frog leap from uninformed optimism over to success. I wish it was that easy. But when you know that this is how your brain's going to work, then you can embrace the ride. Know that you're going to lose motivation. That's why you shouldn't rely on it. You should rely on discipline. Go listen to some Jocko podcasts. He'll scare you a lot more than I do. This is where you go. There's going to be distractions. There's going to be roadblocks. I'm going to have excuses. But be aware of it. Get above it and power through. And here's how you power through. I'm not saying just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. I'm saying use your big why to power through. Use those habits and the discipline that you've created on the front end. Use accountability. Use a plan like Ramsey Plus and Financial Peace University and Total Money Makeover and podcasts and books and all of these great resources that can help you stay motivated and power through and expect to fail. You're not going to be great at budgeting the first week or the second week or the third week. It might take you 90 days to get this thing dialed in. But I'm telling you, it is so worth it. You've got to fall in love with patience. You're not going to do this stuff overnight. Most people pay off their debt in 18 to 24 months. It's not a long time, but for most people who have never achieved their goals, this feels like forever when you're paying off debt and you're working the side job and you're sacrificing. But trust the process. It worked for me. It worked for millions of people out there. And it will work for you too if you actually do this stuff. You know, me and Dave Ramsey, we hosted the Ramsey Show today, and there were some inspirational debt-free screams on the stage. And I love celebrating our fans. I can't help but smile. I want to run through a wall after I listen to these stories. And here's the thread I found, even with the ones today. It started with their identity. They decided they're going to be different kind of people. They decided that they're going to have a big why, that they want to change their family tree, that they're going to leave a different legacy than the one they grew up in that they don't want to see their kids saddled with debt in the same cycles of shame and guilt. So remember, you are designed for growth, to get from point A to point B. And that involves transformation. So let me recap here. You've got to know who you want to be, not just what you want to accomplish. You've got to have a plan for making your goals happen and make it a smart goal. Have those five things and have them in those different areas. And then you've got to create habits to get there and change your habits and change your actions. You know, one of the most inspirational things I've found, and I didn't realize this until lately, but Dave Ramsey has signed probably, I don't know, a billion signatures in his lifetime. That's a conservative estimate. And underneath every signature, if you look closely, it says transform. And underneath that, it says Romans 12, 12. Here's what that verse says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's powerful. What that tells me is it starts with belief. It starts with this belief that things can be different for me, that I can transform, that where I am today doesn't have to be where I end up. And what that creates is a little bit of hope. Transformation starts when you decide to change, and it starts in the mind. And here's what I believe more than anything for you all tonight. If you can change your mind, you can change your habits. And if you can change your habits, you can change your life. I'll leave you with this Dave Ramsey quote. It's worth the trouble to become the person that God made you to be. So my challenge to you is this. Decide what to be and go be it. God bless you guys. Thank you. So I gave you a lot of information right now. Some of you didn't even know cauliflower steak existed. Uh, But if you're feeling overwhelmed and you're going, George, this is all great stuff, man, but I feel like it's going to be another year where I'm overwhelmed and I've got too many goals and you're saying all these areas I need to have goals in and I I just don't know. I don't even know where to start. Well, my friend Christy Wright is about to come up here 
And she's about to show you how to actually fit this in to your life. That's already busy, already crazy, already overwhelming. She's going to show you how to prioritize all of these things and show you how to do the right things at the right time. And I don't know if you heard, but we are celebrating her tonight because her book is a number one bestseller across the nation. We are so pumped for that, and it's for good reason. This is life-changing content in this book, and you're going to get a taste of that tonight. She's a number one best-selling author, of course. She's an amazing mom, wife, teammate. I'm honored to get to work alongside her. She's the host of The Christy Wright Show, and she's going to absolutely inspire you tonight. So please give me a warm welcome for my friend, Christy Wright. so excited to be with y'all. Thanks for being here. Thanks for giving up your night to hang out with us and learn and grow in these different areas of your life. I'm so excited because this session that I get to have with you is something I'm not only passionate about because I've been living it, reading, researching, writing on this topic for a decade, but it's something that affects everything we're talking about. If you're going to reach your goals, you're going to need time to do it. If you're going to reach your financial goals, you're going to need time to do it. If you're going to activate this game plan, you're going to need time to do it, right? So we're going to talk about how to make that work. Now, I'm going to start by telling you, um, for those of you that don't know me, my husband and I are complete opposite personality styles. I married someone my complete opposite. Anybody in here marry someone their complete opposite personality style? Yeah, it's a thing. The whole opposites attract. It's a thing. It works. Ish. Right? <laughs> Most of the time, I guess. So my husband is patient and steady and introverted and quiet and loyal and unemotional and prepared and practical. I am none of those things, okay? But here's what we do have in common. We're both pretty sarcastic. We love to give each other a hard time. We love to kind of like mess with each other. And, and so years ago, back when we were dating, this was maybe, I guess, 12 years ago, back when we were dating, back before, you know, the most exciting thing going on on Saturday was a trip to Home Depot, okay, before kids. Back when we were in this running group, we would go on these adventures. So we would uh, train for marathons, do trivia nights, camping trips, that type of thing. Well, there was this one particular day where all these people, it was probably like 20 of us in this running group, decided to go canoeing. And I was super excited. I actually lived on the Harpeth River, and so I had my own yellow canoe, and so I was super excited. And, um, and like I said, Matt was always giving me a hard time when we were dating and flirting and stuff. And he'd always give me a hard time about missing out on details. Like I would miss out the details of what some race we were supposed to do, or I'd be late to something because I just, I'm just, I'm what Dave calls a free spirit. Okay. Don't box me in. So he was always giving me a hard time about this. Well, on this particular Saturday, we're all meeting at Target to go canoeing. All of our friends, there's 20 of us. And so I loaded up the yellow canoe on the top of my old 1996 Jeep Grand Cherokee that smelled like a go-kart, and I prayed it back to life more times than I can count. And I get to Target first, and I'm super proud of myself. I'm like, I don't know. This feels like an opportunity to brag a little. So I pull up my phone, and I start to text Matt. Again, we're dating, so we're in that little flirty, you know, whatever stage. And so I just draft a text to him, and I say, well, um, looks like I beat you to Target. Boom. Hit send. So I wait, like, <laughs> I am so clever. <laughs> wait, I see the little dots, you know, he's typing back. He's like, you're at the wrong target. We're all waiting on you. <laughs> A couple seconds later, boom. <laughs> I was really proud of myself for getting to somewhere I didn't even need to be. And you know what? We all do the same thing. We all rush really hard to do things that don't matter. We work really hard to check off a to-do list and never ask ourselves if any of those things represent anything worth doing. We show up to commitments on our calendar and never question if those are commitments we even care about, if they even move us in the direction of the vision of our life. We work really, really hard for a life that we don't even like. And we never question if there is another way we race so hard to get to a finish line we don't even want to cross. Some of you are amazing at answering emails and checking off boxes on your to-do list and showing up for meetings and, and commitments on your calendars, and we never stop to ask ourselves if any of those things represent anything worth doing. Peter Drucker said, there's nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency that which shouldn't be done at all. And a lot of us, 
are so busy, not because our world is crazy, that's a piece of it, not because, oh my gosh, we just, we're just so important, we're so busy, we just are such big helpers, we're such a good Christian, we love to save the day, we're, we're so needed. It's because we are reacting, doing things that don't even matter, and we're used to it. We're so used to rushing around, we don't even know how to rest. We don't know how to stare at the elevator doors and not pick out our phone. We don't know how to be still. We don't know how to even consider that when an invitation comes through in our calendar, to even question if we want to do it, if it's right for us, if it matters. And then we sometimes are the worst. We pile on the pressure. You might knock out some of your to-do lists, and what do you do? You just put more on. You just pile more on. Never even question it. You just pile more on. Sometimes, some of you guys are so excited about your to-do list, you go back and put something on it when you've already done it. Just so you can check it off. Have you done that? Say yes. Yes. But you know what happens? We become a cruel taskmaster in our own lives. And we're tired. We're really, really tired. We think the problem is we don't have enough time. Oh, I just need more time. You don't need more time. I got to tell you, you don't need more time. If you had more time, you would cram more crap in. You don't need more time. The problem is not more time. And then we think, oh, well, maybe the problem with balance, maybe my problem with balance is I'm just, I just am not productive enough. I just need to do more. I need to get more productive. I need to get more efficient. I know what I need to do. I need to become a morning person. Yes, I need to become a morning person. I need to wake up earlier. I need to pour more coffee. I need a better morning routine. I need a special app that's going to help me, help me multitask and be efficient and productive. And I just need to run harder and run faster. I need to work smarter and harder. No harder, no smarter. I'm going to multitask the smarter and the harder and run really fast and stay up later. And all we end up is exhausted, not more balanced. Turns out the path to balance is not Productivity. The path to balance is not doing more. You've tried that, and it has not worked. It's not doing more. It's not being more productive. And what's so interesting with this word balance, and we've got a lot of feelings about it, but what's so interesting is that we can't even define it. We don't even know what we mean. But you can't achieve something you never define. We don't know what balance is. We're just sure we don't have it, right? It becomes this shadow that haunts us, this thing that evades us. We always feel like we're failing. Oh, I just need more balance. I need to balance it all. How do you balance it all? How do you balance everything? It just becomes this thing that haunts us. And even if you hate the word, and lots of people hate the word, Dave Ramsey hates the word, this is something that even if you hate the word, we can't stop talking about it. I have been a business coach for over a decade, and the number one question that I have been asked in the last 10 years is not a business question. It's this question. How do you balance it all? How do you balance everything? How do you have work-life balance? How do you balance having a full-time job and having side hustles where you're trying to get out of debt? How do you balance having a work, a a, a full-time career, and having a family? How do you balance all the different goals? How do you balance it all? And we've got all the analogies, don't we? Oh, we've got all the visuals. We've got juggling balls, spinning plates, walking a tightrope, and some balls are rubber and some balls are glass. Which balls can you let drop on a Tuesday? We've got all the analogies. Can we just, Zach Morris, time out for a second? Like, can we talk about these images? Have you ever seen a juggler? Like, that looks crazy, y'all. Do you want to live like that? Like, their their whole body is wiggling around trying to keep things flying there. Have you ever seen a tightrope walker? Every muscle on their body is tense. I don't want to live like that. Every image you hear in regards to balance from spinning plates to juggling balls to walking tightrope sounds like something in a circus. Maybe this is the problem. Our lives are a circus, and we wonder what the problem is. And no matter what we do, we feel like we're doing the wrong thing. We just feel like we need to juggle better and spin plates faster and walk the tightrope. I don't know about you, but that's not how I want to live my life. So it led me down this path as I started writing this book. It led me down this path to ask a different question. What if 
balance isn't so much something you do, how you balance it all perfectly, these images that we have. What if instead balance is something you could create in your life, where you could actually have a sense of balance, but still be busy? Where you could be a balanced person in an out-of-balance world? Where balance looks more like peace being confident in your choices when you say yes to that thing or no to that thing, being proud of how you spend your time for once in your life, actually enjoying your life. I think that's what we're after. I think that's what we really want when we say we want balance. We don't want this perfect 50-50 split. What we want is to be proud of how we spend our time in our one life we've been given. I think we want peace and confidence and actually enjoying our life. This is not so much about the calendar. It's about enjoying the life that that calendar represents. And it turns out the path to that is not productivity. It's not just doing more. And so while we have all these mixed feelings about the word balance, oh, you know, balance is juggling and spinning plates and and walking the tightrope. We have all these analogies. We also have a lot of different definitions. Some people think, oh, well, life balance is a 50-50 split. You work 50% of the time, you're at home 50% of the time, this is what leads to balance, and it doesn't. You can do that and still feel like something's not right. And by the way, that's completely impractical for most of us. But there's another definition, and a lot of people feel like, well, Balance is where you just do everything all the time, everything equally. So every day I'm going to have my quiet time and my quality time with my husband, my quality time with my kids, my quality time alone, and my quality time with God, and I'm going to work, I'm going to crush my goals, hit my to-do list, be a good friend, show up at church, and then, oh, by the way, get a workout in before bed. That's not realistic. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to reclaim this word to redefine this word, to show you a version of balance that is not only possible, but maybe just the type of balance you're actually looking for, where you can take back your time and actually enjoy your life. And this definition is this. Life balance is not doing everything for an equal amount of time. It's about doing the right things at the right time. When you do the right things at the right time, you actually feel that sense of balance that you've been looking for all along. But it wasn't because you did everything. It was because you finally gave yourself permission to focus on the right things. That definition is the thesis of my new book, Take Back Your Time, that George was talking about. But I want to boil this book down to one question. Okay, I lay out a path in the book. It's five practical steps to balance. But I want to boil it down to one question that you could take home today. You can literally go home, talk to your spouse, talk to your kids, and you can start using this to determine your calendar today. Here's the question. What's right right now? What's right right now? Here's the great news. You get to decide what's right for you in any new season. And guess what? What's right for you today might be different than what was right Six months ago, six years ago, will be a year from now. In any new season, your season will determine what matters to you so you have permission to focus on what's right right now. Think about this summer. We had the Olympics this summer. Olympians were training. How many hours a week for those events? I mean, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. That was actually right for them. That was their version of balance because they were doing the right things at the right time. It was the Summer Olympics. This is what they were training for. A new mom that's just had a baby, and she's just trying to get two hours of sleep at a time. She's trying to get one shower a week and not snap at everybody because she's got no sleep. That's balanced because you know what? She's doing the right things at the right time. I had a farm in my early 20s with fainting goats and a mini donkey, which is kind of weird, but you know what? It was right. You get to decide what's right for you. I'm not going to tell you what you should spend your time on. But what I do want to do is what I believe good coaches do. I want to ask you questions that help you decide that for yourself. What's right right now? What's right for you? Is it working three jobs to pay off your debt snowball faster? Maybe it looks like getting help to get you out of the rut that you've been in. Maybe what's right for you is changing some of those habits that George Campbell talked about so that you can actually get different results? What's right 
right now? Here's what's so powerful about this question, and I don't want you to miss it. When you ask yourself what's right right now, you not only give yourself permission to do that, to focus on that, to make progress on that, to be present for it, to be proud of it, which, by the way, that in itself is pretty incredible in the world we live in where everyone's weighed down by guilt. But here's the awesome thing. Not only are you focusing on what's right right now and being present for it and proud of it, you shake the guilt for all the things that are not right right now. It gives you confidence to say no to that invitation, to decline that request, to not put those 19 things on your to-do list because that's not right right now. And just because something's not right right now doesn't mean it will never be right. It just means it's not right right now. So what's right right now for you? If you're going to do the right things at the right time, you need to know what the right things are. What's most important? Not what is good, what is fun, what are my friends doing, what are my neighbors doing, what do my in-laws think I should be doing? No, no, no. What is most important to you right now? I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. But Christy, it's all important. I know, I hear you, it's all important. You've got all these things, it's all important. I didn't think of that um, when I wrote this book. I I didn't plan for that. It's all important. No, it's not! No, it's not. It's not all important. I hear it in your stories. I hear it from people I talk to. Even when they rattle off their to-do list, they say it as if it's all created equal. Well, you know, I mean, I've got to pay my bills and steam clean my couch cushions, and I've got to go to work, and I've got to also make homemade gluten-free muffins for everyone in the neighborhood, and also I need to feed my kids and, and reorganize the attic. These are not created equal. Everything is not important. And as long as you pretend like it is, as long as you refuse to acknowledge that your time is finite, newsflash, you get 24 hours in a day. If that's the first time you've heard that, I'm so glad I could bless you today with this information. I'm here. I'm here for you. You get 24 hours in a day. So you get to decide what makes the cut, just like in your budget. What makes the cut and what does not make the cut? What is a priority and what is not a priority in this season? What is right right now and what is not right right now? If you refuse to acknowledge that your time is finite and you just insist on cramming everything above the line, I can rush, I can multitask, I can, I can leave this one a little early and then, and then speed through traffic and then I can run here and get there and, I can, and then I can... If that's your solution and you just insist on cramming everything above the line, then here's what I want you to understand. You don't get to decide what drops. And you're steam cleaning your couch cushions and your kids are starving. And you're reorganizing the attic and you haven't paid your bills. And you're focusing on the wrong thing because you never took the time to be honest with yourself about what's actually important, to prioritize those things, to determine what's right right now and choose what's not gonna make the cut, what does not fall above the line. This simple concept of prioritizing, as tactical as it is, I got to tell you guys, we suck at it. We're pretty terrible at priorities. We're pretty terrible at prioritizing in a tactical way with our budget or or, or especially with our time. We just think we, we can multitask and run harder, drink a little more coffee. We can get it all in. But here's the truth. We need to understand what I actually mean by priorities. Because I do hear some misunderstandings around this word. Some people, no one in this room, I'm sure, but some people think of priorities as a set it and forget it thing, right? Like you have one set of priorities for your whole life. They're in concrete, signed in blood, and they never, ever, ever change. I hear people say sometimes like, well, I know my priorities. My priorities are God, others, self in that order. I'm like, that is a beautiful Sunday school answer. That didn't help me manage my Tuesday, right? So here's what I want you all to consider, okay? Yes, we all have a set of what I call fixed priorities. Fixed priorities would be your list of priorities. If push comes to shove and all hell breaks loose, this is what matters in this order. My children, of course, fall above my work in that order, in this list, If God called me to do something, yes, I would submit to God in a very practical way in this order of fixed priorities. You probably have that. Now, thankfully, 
We don't live in a world where push comes to shove and all hell is breaking loose on a regular basis. Thank the Lord for that. So here's what you need. You also need a second set of what I call flexible priorities. These priorities are more current, more relevant, more specific than your fixed priorities. So they might look something like this uh, in the spring, for example. In the spring, I sat down with my husband. We talked about the spring season. One of our priorities was getting our boys to swim. It's pretty specific. The summer was coming up. They were age appropriate. We love to be around the water. So you need priorities that reflect the season that you're in that are more specific so you know how to manage your time. Well, because we decided that, then every Friday, I went by their school, picked them up, put them on one piece in February, took them to the YMCA, got in the pool, and practiced swimming. This summer, put them in swim lessons. And now both of my boys are jumping off the high dive and swimming across the pool. That didn't happen by accident. It happened because I determined that that was a priority and that informed my calendar in a practical way. Some of you never feel successful in your, how you manage your time because you just never define what success is. You don't know what you want to do in this season. You never stop. You never even stop to consider yourself before you pile on the pressure. What would it look like to start each season or each week or each day and go, what matters most to me today? How am I doing? Where you check in with yourself and you consider yourself before you pour the coffee, pile on the pressure, and just run and react. Where you started a season, and when I say season, you can define what that looks like. For me, I, my, my year kind of falls in three main seasons, spring, summer, and fall with work, with my kids' calendar, that type of thing. And so I will literally start a season and cast a vision and say, what do I want this season to look like? So let me give you an example. I love walking through examples. In the summer, it was a lighter season at work. It was lighter in general. We have less events in the summer. Fall and spring are pretty busy. So I was taking time off. My house was pretty clean. I saw my friends a lot. Had a lot of good quality time with my kids. I was working out. Like I, all these things were making the cut because it was a lighter season. Okay, this season's different. Okay, we have transitioned from that season. So now three things make the cut. Work, launching my book, that comes first. My kids, that comes second. Now, before you write me off and send me your hate mail about how I'm a terrible mom, these are flexible priorities that are more honest, more current, relevant, and specific to the season you're in. So if I get an opportunity to go to New York and talk about this book because I want to help a lot of people, I'm going to say yes to that. It doesn't mean I'm a bad mom. It means I'm honest about what I'm focusing on with my time. So first and foremost is launching a book and work. Second, my family. I'm going to be with my kids and my husband anytime that I'm not doing that. And third, I'm in seminary. It's pretty consuming. All three of those are pretty consuming. Now, here's what I want you to understand. I'm not seeing my friends very much. I'm not working out very much. And my house is not near as clean as I'd like it to be. But because I'm doing what's right right now for me, I'm focusing on what's right right now for me, I am able to walk through my living room, step over toys, and instead of beat myself up for what a failure I am like I would in the past, I can look at those toys and go, girl, that's not right right now. You're reading 300 pages a week on Revelation. You're doing great. <laughs> What's right right now for you? What makes the cut? When you determine what your priorities actually are, you can put them on your calendar and spend time on them. You can focus on them, be present for them, be proud of them. And then so importantly, you can shake the guilt for all the things that are not right right now. I don't know what season you're in. I don't know what your financial goals are. I don't know what your marriage goals are. I don't know what your fitness goals are. I don't know what your life looks like. Maybe you've got a parent that you're taking care of that has a health diagnosis, and taking care of them is A1. Maybe you've got a child that's really struggling, and you've got to be hands-on with them, and you've got to really take a lot of extra time. Ask yourself what's right right now. When you do this, you will finally be spending your time on what's right for you, and you will be able to create your version of balance. My mom, um, some of you have heard me talk about this before, but my mom started a little cake shop when I was six months old to raise and support me. And while it's a cute story to tell, my childhood was less than idyllic. It was not Pinterest perfect. She pulled me out of bed at 2 and 3 in the morning to go to the cake shop so she would bake cakes in downtown Nashville. 
I remember I'd go to sleep on the 50 pound bags of powdered sugar and flour and make a little bed at three in the morning and go to sleep there until it was time to go to school. And uh, I remember I would take over her baking racks and she needed to like cool the cakes. I'm like, I'm sorry, my baby's sleeping. <laughs> but I remember the struggle. I remember going to the cake shop one time at um, four in the morning, still pitch black outside and someone had broken in. There was glass everywhere. We didn't know if the person was still inside. I remember getting a flat tire in the rain. Mom had an old car that was always having problems. Mom was a single mom and I was an only child and I was in the struggle with her. But here's what I want you to know as I look around this room, and I know you guys at home as well, of all these parents, you might feel fear that you're harming your kids by the struggle by, oh, we've got some tough times, we've got to make some sacrifices, we're paying off debt, dad's taken three jobs, mom's got a side business, we're hustling, we're doing everything we can, no, I'm sorry, we can't go on vacation, and Christmas is going to be smaller. Here's what I want you to hear from me as the child of a mom that struggled. I did not make it despite the struggle. I made it because of it. My mother did not teach me work ethic and character and perseverance and persistence. She lived it out in front of me, and therefore, I learned it. I am who I am because of my mother. So don't you dare be sorry for the struggle. Whatever season you're in, you have permission to do what's right for you. When you do, you're not just going to be doing the right things at the right time. You're not just going to be creating balance. You're going to take back your time. You're going to take back your life. Thank you guys so much for having me. I've loved being with you guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And now, to bring us home, I have the pleasure of introducing the man himself, the main event, the founder of our company, New York Times bestselling author, and the man we all know and love, Mr. Dave Ramsey. Please welcome to the stage. So proud of her. Y'all remember when we had a pandemic? <laughs> so I had never been through one of those before. Maybe you have. But um, it, it was hard. I got a thousand people on my team, and a lot of them are youngsters, and they have little babies. And some of them are single moms, and some of them are single dads. And I was really worried that some of them were not going to have a job. It scared the crap out of me. It was stressful. And I went, I mean, we, we came here to Ramsey Solutions. The team went home to quarantine. You know, we had to do that stuff for a little while, and before they all came back, they're, they're working from home, and they were actually working from home, which usually work from home doesn't mean that, but doesn't mean much work. But um, I, they were actually working, and we were trying to figure out how to like, keep Ramsey open, uh, not because I need more money. I got plenty of money. I'm okay with that, but I just feel this tremendous responsibility as their leader to make sure that that single mom has money to feed her kid. And that comes from payroll that is created by revenue at this company. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So it was, I, I never been anything. I mean, I'm just a kid from Antioch, Tennessee, and I grew this thing, and now I've got this weight, and I have to figure this thing out. And it scared the crap out of me. We were down here, we were working at this office, and we're doing media appearances, trying to give people hope, and we're, you know, we're writing up and doing, and we're pivoting so much that we think we just got one leg, and, you know, and um, don't ever tell me to pivot again, I'll hit you, and, um, uh, and unprecedented, there's another word I don't ever want to hear again, y'all know what I'm talking about, it's just shoot me, and um, we were, we were down here, we were working like 16 hours a day. And we were, I was just working like a madman. And not, not again, not because I'm greedy and needed money. I don't need money. I could have just gone home and put my feet up. But I believe I was responsible for those families that I told them I was going to pay them and I should do that. And so we're working like crazy. And I found out something about myself during that time. Um, 
I, you know, a lot of you react differently to stress than I do. I, I, first thing I do is I get pissed off and, <laughs> and I'm just in a fight mode. Y'all know what I mean? You just get in fight mode. And it's just like anybody who said anything, I just wanted to hit them. It was just awful. I had to, I had to really guard my tongue and my spirit because I was just in whoop, mode. Right. And so, and the other thing I found out is when I'm stressed out, I eat <laughs> a lot, apparently. And so I gained like 37 pounds or 40 pounds in just like no time. Because apparently I ate every donut in a 50-mile radius. <laughs> it was awful. And I was, you know, I was wa- working all the time, but then I walked past a mirror in the daylight once before I got to, you know, and I went, whoa, <laughs> fat boy, <laughs> this is not good. And uh, I said, we got to fix this. This is cray cray. I mean, I'm just going to explode. I look like I've been stung with a bee. You know, it was just, and so, uh, wow. So I got like this app to count my calendar calories. And I got another app that counts how many days in a row I walked a mile. And then how many days I walked two miles. And then how many days I ran a mile. And then how many, once this weight started coming off. And uh I quit eating every donut inside. I hadn't had a donut in 14 months. I just will swear to God, that's the truth. And um, I just quit. I had to. And I lost 37 pounds. I mean, but I got so fat. You know what? I just said, you know, enough. You know, it's kind of like when I was growing up. uh, You know, again, I kind of grew up a hillbilly kid. And and, and my mama was a, a sweet lady, but she'd have enough after a while, you know what I'm saying? And we had all these kids running in and out of the house, running in and out of the house. Your mama ever say stuff like, uh, you know, were you raising a barn? Close the door. Are you air conditioning in the whole neighborhood? Close the door. This is the kind of stuff she'd say all day long. There'd be kids in and out of the house, in and out of the house. And finally, she would turn with this look in her eye with a butcher, hand in one, butcher knife in one hand and a wooden spoon in the other. And she would say, that's it. The worm has turned. And we had no idea what that meant. Except the beatings were about to begin. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Found out later the worm has turned with Shakespeare. Who knew mom knew Shakespeare? But <laughs> that's it. I've had it. When you say that and you mean it, you're about to change your life. And until you say that, and you mean it. It's a freaking wussified intellectual exercise. And you're not going to do it. It has to be visceral, visceral and come from down inside of you. And you say, that's it, fat boy. Get away from the donuts. <laughs> you got to say, that's it. I'm sick and tired of making this much money and having nothing to show for it. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now you're ready to change your life. And until you do that, you won't. When I was 28 years old, I borrowed way too much money in a real estate nothing down scheme that I got myself into. I made a lot of money. But I built a house of cards, and it fell in on me, and I lost everything I owned, and I went bankrupt, and I had to start over, and I was a baby Christian, and I was just learning what the Bible said about anything, and I learned the Bible had some things to say about money, and I compared it with my grandpa's common sense, and it sounded similar. And I went, that's it. I've had it. One of the benefits of going broke is that you no longer care what other people think. (laughs) I really would just like to eat now. I'm not really concerned about your opinion or your broke brother-in-law's opinion. And by the way, you live in Washington, D.C., which pretty much makes you an idiot, you know? So I'm just not going to, I don't need any of this stuff. I need need to learn like something that I can actually apply in my life and feed my family and control the controllables and control my destiny. I can't control everything, but I can control the old boy in this mirror. And if I get him under control, he can get some stuff moved around. And I started learning about money. Now, George talked to you about goals. And he said, set very specific goals, put a time frame on them. Very good stuff. Christy talked to you about how to take your time back and get this stuff lined up. And, and what we're talking about here is the whole idea that personal finance 
is 80% behavior. It's only 20% head knowledge. The problem with my money is the guy I shave with every morning. If I can get that guy to behave, he can be skinny and rich. But he has issues. And he has to say, I've had it. I'm ready to change. I got a bunch of youngsters working on my team, and they, <laughs> they're wonderful. Everybody gives a millennial generation a hard time. And I got to tell you, I disagree. I think this millennial generation is absolutely amazing. The, the, there's only two kinds, awesome and sucks. <laughs> I mean, they're either entitlement driven, arrogant little brats who think because they have a social media account that they actually should have an opinion, or they are the biggest hearted, hardest working, smartest, driven, charge the gates of hell with a water pistol people you've ever seen in your life. They're the most crusaders of any generation I've ever worked with, and i got a building full of them. I love them. I think they're amazing. And they're easy to interview because they come in and they go, I'm awesome or I suck. You know, they'll tell you in the interview, <laughs> right? You can just decide, not that one and yes on that one. Yeah, and it's just a lot easier. So i got, I got a good one, but I'm coming around the building, and there's a little guy doing the stuff he's supposed to be doing wrong, and I'm like, don't do it that way. Do it this way. And he said, yes, sir. And I came back a week later, and he's doing the stuff he's supposed to be doing wrong. I said, don't do it that way. And I came back a week later, and he's doing it wrong again. I said, boy, we're going to set you free in Jesus' name. <laughs> I done told you three times there's a right way to do this and a wrong way to do this, and I happen to sign your check. It's not good management technique, but... Just got to sometimes get through. And so he looks at me and he says, but I'm not like you. And I said, I know. I'm right. You're wrong. We're different. You need to be more like me. This is what I'm trying to convince you of. And he says, yeah, but, and I said, no, change. Isn't it interesting that you can just decide to You have that power. You being a jerk to your wife? Change. You, you, you grouchy every night when you get home and you snap at your kids? Change. You don't work so much or you never show up on time? Change. Isn't it fun? <laughs> you can just decide. And, and that is a game plan, by the way. You fail and finally say, I've had it. No donuts. I don't like my clothes not fitting. <laughs> Y'all get it? I don't like being broke. I've been collecting airline miles and I have no money. I fell for a bunch of lies by banks. No more. I changed. Just like that. Isn't that fun? I just decided... You know what? I don't have credit cards anymore. They haven't made me successful. So I'm going to have a plastectomy. Plastic surgery. Discover freedom. American distress. Marriott. Why would I ever do that? Target. Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh. Almost got away. <laughs> Bank of America. <laughs> Citibank. Chase. What's in your wallet? Money. You're weird. You don't have any credit cards. You're right. I don't have any credit cards. I went broke, remember? This is my wallet. I have th four pieces of plastic in here and some green president's faces. I, I have a debit card on my business and a debit card on my personal account and my driver's license and my handgun carry permit. And that's the only plastic I got. And for those of you from another world or another country or something, in Tennessee, we actually have guns. It's weird. And so... <laughs> But uh, y'all are all safe, I promise. But, but you know, I mean, it, it, isn't it weird? And, and, and I just decided. So here's the thing. Normal sucks. It's mediocre. It's average. It's typical. It's bad. You don't want a normal marriage. You don't want normal kids, for God's sake. You've seen them in the restaurant. You don't want a normal physique. Have you seen that? I had one, you know. Getting rid of it, I was not quite done, but yeah. 
All right? I mean, and you certainly don't want to be normal with money. 36% of Americans don't have the cash to cover a $400 emergency. 400 bucks! And this is in a country where the average household income is $60,000 a year. And they can't come up with 400 bucks. Why are you people spending like you're in Congress? 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. That's eight out of 10 houses on your street are broke. They have too much month left at the end of the money. Number one cause of divorce in North America today, money fights and money problems because in those eight out of 10 houses, life is not fun. We're just barely making it because we bought a bunch of crap with money we didn't have to impress people that we didn't even really like. And it's sitting in the driveway, and it's sitting in the bedroom, and it's sitting on the wall, and I had to have a new one, a better one, a bigger one. In the richest country the world has ever known, normal is broke. 55% of workers say they are not where they need to be with their retirement goals. Earl Nightingale used to say people spend more time picking out a suit of clothes than they do picking their retirement plan options. So we're talking about game plans tonight. I want to give you three elements of a really good game plan. Now, at the beginning of the night, I told you to, you guys in the stream to put down on your comments what you thought. The most important money element is, and I'm going to give it to you right now, it's get on a budget. Do a written plan. I told you at the beginning of the night, no one wins by accident. A budget is a written plan. A budget is goal setting like George taught you for money. Jesus said, don't build a tower without first counting the cost, lest you get halfway up and you're unable to finish it. And all who see you begin to mock you and say, this man began to build and was unable to finish. My friend John Maxwell used to say, or does say, that, that a budget is people telling their money what to do instead of wondering where it went. You ever sit down and do your taxes? And you go, we just made $110,000. Would somebody tell me where it went? I'm wondering where it went because I never told it what to do. My friend Zig Ziglar used to say, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Winning is not an accidental event. It is the cumulative effect of positive habits and positive processes and systems that you put in your life, whether it's to lose weight, to have a great marriage, to be balanced in your time, to set goals, or to handle your money. On paper, on purpose, before the month begins. If you worked for a company called You Incorporated, and your job at You Incorporated was to manage money for You Incorporated, and You look down and you manage money the way you manage money now. Would you fire you? Don't answer that. Then don't pray and ask God to send you money. Because he loves you enough to say no. You suck at money. Why would I give you more? It will destroy your life. You ever seen people get a lot of money that are bad at it? It messes them up. And God loves you too much. He says only when you're faithful with the little things. Well, then I give you more to manage. My son, when he was 14 years old, he said, Daddy, I want to get a brand new Corvette when I turn 16. I said, son, I have seen you drive. You suck at this. You will not be getting a new Corvette. It's 465 horsepower, 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds. It's fiberglass body. You kill yourself and somebody else. What kind of idiot father would give a child a rocket ship on wheels that can't drive? You will be getting an old Chevette with a tired gerbil under the hood. (laughs) And when you are faithful with the little things, my son, you will be given more to manage. Trusted with a nicer car. But don't be going, I'm irresponsible. I have no savings. I'm deeply in debt. I don't do a budget. But God, would you send me money? He won't answer that prayer. The answer is no. That's a possible answer to prayer. Some of people don't know that, but that's a, that's a biblical thing, by the way. No, because your heavenly father's crazy about you. He's not going to hurt you. And money, when it comes to people that are messed up, makes them more messed up. It's a pretty simple equation. So 
change. We're going to do a written plan on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. I'm going to be proud of my eating habits. I'm going to be proud that for 542 days, as of this morning, I have walked or run one and a half to five miles every single morning, but three when I was in bed with some kind of mysterious fever. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? I know exactly where I am. It's a measurable thing. What you measure is what's going to occur in your life. I know how many calories I've eaten. I've now logged four. 1,874 consecutive meals. I know exactly what's going into my body. Consequently, I'm not as fat as I was. Why is this a miracle? You won't be as broke when you make your money behave. On paper, on purpose, before the month begins. You'll feel like you got a raise. And for those of you that are married, if you do it together the way you're supposed to, It will create communication that your spouse has always yearned for. You will talk about things that you never talked about before. Just kind of drove past them and went, I don't even know what to do with that. that." When you talk about money, right, you got to deal with it. Because you spend your money on what's important to you. And when you align what's important to you, that's called unity in your marriage. Most marriage counselors use budgeting as a technique to force couples to communicate that are struggling. And even if you're not struggling, you will do much better. Sharon and I don't fight about money because we agree on what is on the paper before the month begins. Every month, on paper, on purpose, before the month begins. It's a habit now. It's fairly easy now because there's a lot of money on it. Used to be it was really tight. And there was little kids and we were scared to death and we didn't know what we were doing. Nowadays, all these years later, there's a lot more margin in there, but it's still on purpose. We get a big old hairy check from a publisher. We still sit down and go, big hairy check coming. What are we going to do with it? On paper, on purpose, before the month begins. No one wins accidentally or randomly. You plant corn and mysteriously corn grows. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Every time I plant stupid, desperate grows. And I have had some serious crops of stupid come in at times in my life. Y'all may have never done this, but I've got a Ph.D. in D-U-M-B. I've done it all wrong. I know how this feels. The second thing is get out of debt. Now, you knew Dave Ramsey was going to say that. Why? Because when you don't have any payments, you have money. It's your most powerful wealth-building tool is your income. The average car payment in America today is $526 over 84 months. Let me help you with a little math. If you're 30 years old and you invest $536 in a decent growth stock mutual fund in a Roth IRA from age 30 to age 65, you'll have about $5.4 million. That's what your car costs you. I hope you like it. (laughs) Meanwhile, the stupid thing's going down in value like a rock. That's where Chevy got that, like a rock. (laughs) And you Ford people are no better at all. It's found on the road depreciated, F-O-R-D, okay? (laughs) They all go down in value. We love our cars. Some of you ladies think it's just a very large purse. But guys, we love our cars. But they're the largest thing we buy that goes down in value. And you walk around the car payment going, well, everybody has a car payment. Everybody's life sucks. You won't be like everybody. Normal's bad. We established that earlier. 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck with two new cars sitting in the driveway and a bass boat. I need a bigger engine because those bass are outrunning me. What? $600 boat payment. Shoot me and get it over with. I wonder why your kid's college fund didn't fund it. Your largest wealth building tool is your income. Children do what feels good. Adults devise a plan, and follow it. We change. Dave, can you get me out of debt? I mean, we have people come in, you know, the borrower is slave to the lender. Y'all know that, right? We have people come in the office all the time. They go, you know, Sally Mae's got her own bedroom. We've got American distress, and we bought a new car, and then we bought a house we can't afford. Oh, man, 
this is not going to go well. People come in our office look like this all the time. They're like, Dave, can you get me out? I'm like, yeah, but it's going to hurt. We're going to have to amputate the Tahoe. (laughs) What? You mean I can't own things that I can't pay for? Not if you want to be wealthy. Because you're giving all your money to them. It's all going to them. When all the money comes in and all the money goes out, and only the names are changed to protect the innocent, the borrower is slave to the lender. It's a mathematical thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a relational thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a psychological thing. It's stunting America's growth. We have an epic student loan problem. Trillions of dollars. Kids in their 20s are putting off getting married, having kids, putting off buying a house because they're overwhelmed and slammed and destroyed because idiots in Washington and in higher ed told them that no matter what you pay for a degree, it's worth it. Bull crap. So I got $225,000 invested in my left-handed puppetry degree. But it came from a big name famous university, which means I can now get a job pouring coffee somewhere. And this is the lie that we told people. Now, I'm not for being dumb. I like education. I just don't like overpriced, priced, stupid education from famous universities that make you think you're somebody because you went there. I went to a state school, graduated in four whole years. I paid for it, all but little b student loan. Back then, it wasn't very expensive. Back then, I worked 60 hours a week. Shut up. Dad gum whining. Deal, man, you got to decide. No more. I'm done. Well, Dave, I use my cards for the points. We, uh, you know, we did the largest survey of millionaires ever done in North America. We interviewed 10,167 of them. No one's ever done a research project this size on millionaires. We finished it about three years ago. And, you know, a strange thing, it's just, I know it's weird, but we interviewed, we asked them how they did it. We asked them what they used. How did you become a millionaire? Uh, by the way, 90, 89% of them did not inherit the money that caused them to become a millionaire. Just by the way, just in case you were wondering about the statistics. So some of you people are lying. Okay, about that, yeah. Bye. And so these are actu- this actual research is called data facts. Okay. And so and um, everyone inherited their money that's wealthy. You are a leftist socialist pig, okay? That's just not true. Now, got that out of the way. I feel a whole lot better now. All right, but... Um, They didn't inherit their money. It's a fact, regardless of your politics or which form of economics you're in, okay? But, but the truth is this. Not a single one of them said, Dave, you know, I made all my money with my airline miles. <laughs> Not a single millionaire said that. And yet I hear people all the time going, you know, I'm, I'm winning, I'm using the card responsibly. I just haven't found that to be true. Not in real data anyway. It's feelings and it's justification for behaviors. It's like, yeah, I know, but I can eat 16 donuts because I have a high metabolism rate. Well, I don't apparently, so I don't have that as an option. I had to change. And I haven't had a credit card in 30 years. And I'm doing okay. Isn't that weird? And see, the whole idea of getting out of debt is you first have to actually believe you can. You have to actually look at the math and go, I mean, y'all, if any of you listen to the Ramsey show, it's amazing to me. I have people call up, they make $160,000 a year. They have $42,000 in debt. I'm going, dude, can you get by on 120 for a year and clear it? Oh, wow, I never thought I could get out of debt. They didn't even thought about the math. To me, it's just like a ratio of shovel to hole. How big a shovel you got? What's your income versus the hole you're in? And look at that shovel to hole ratio, and I can divide into it pretty quick and go, you know, you make $140,000 a year, you got $80,000 in debt, let's do 40 a year for two years, you're out. That's, you know, I, I can, I mean, you got $80,000 in debt, we can do 40 a year for two years, you're out. Shut up, shut up, shut up. do it. But you have to believe, and sometimes you have to sit down and do the math to actually believe that you can do it. Henry Ford used to say, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. You're right. Are people like me? What are people like you? I don't understand. 
When you come from the way I came from, what's that mean? Every place that anybody came from, any color, any sex, any background, any history, any ethnicity, whatever you want to measure, were in the millionaire studies. They were all there. It was, not a, it was not based on where they came from. It was based on where they were going to that got them there. They said, uh-uh, I'm not living like I was raised. Cray-cray back there, not doing this. Y'all know what I'm talking about? You know, we're not doing this. And it's not a disrespect to the last generation. It's just going, didn't work well, trying something new. Change. Well, is it harder for some people? Yeah, some are dumber than others. <laughs> some don't work as hard as others. It's harder for me. I, I mean, look at this. I get to be on TV. I'm not sure why. I should be just on radio with his face, right? And so, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I'm on everything, but it's just because they want to hear my mouth, I guess. I don't know. But, I mean, Peyton Manning threw a football better than me. That's just not fair, y'all. Brad Paisley played play, play guitar better than me. It's just not fair. So it's easier for people that are beautiful and talented. And da, 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 da. But I didn't get dealt that hand, so I got to deal with this guy. This guy is my problem. Peyton ain't my problem. I can be jealous and bitter and envious and all these stupid emotions, or I can just go, Dave, let's get with it, son. I'm going to take responsibility for what I got dealt. And from here, we're going. doesn't matter where you're coming from. All that matters is where you're going to. That's all that matters. And I've got data to prove it to you regardless of your background. Well, the little man can't get ahead. What's well, Eeyore, your spirit animal? I mean, come on. <laughs> of course the little man can get ahead. It's about all that gets ahead these days. Washington has seen to it that the big man gets his head cut off. They take everything from him. Had y'all noticed? I mean, you know, the rich people get all the breaks. No, they don't. It's quite the opposite. We have 51% of Americans that pay zero federal income tax. The little man is getting a deal. So use it and change. And go be somebody. It's a decision, y'all. It's a decision. You can do it. The third one is when you're on a written plan and you get yourself out of debt. See, when you don't have any payments, it's easy to build wealth. It's easy to save money. It's easy to buy things and pay cash for them. When you don't have any payments, when you get out of the payment business, you're just going to have money to do stuff with. It's a weird thing. So it's worth the price. It's worth it to say, I've had it. We're selling so much stuff, the kids think they're next. <laughs> I've had it. We're going to list our debts smallest to largest and pay minimum payments on everything but the little one. And we're going to attack the little one with a vengeance. A good plan violently executed today is better than a perfect plan discussed in your mother's basement on a blog. <laughs> now I'm a financial blogger. Isn't that neat? I'm not gainfully employed. My mommy does my clothing but I'm a financial blogger. These are the influencers in our culture today. God help me. Ugh. So now, get up off your butt. Go sell so much stuff. Work. My grandmother used to say, there's a great place to go when you're broke. To work. This is what's right right now. Six jobs. I'm tired of being broke. Lots of OT. I'm tired of being broke. I had three nurses this year come in, made $600,000, $500,000, and $700,000 this year as traveling COVID nurses. You know what they saw COVID as? An opportunity to pay off their house. Now, they're brave souls, and they put themselves out there in the unknown world. It's a crazy world we live in. They're to be admired for that. But they had a goal, and they saw an opportunity, and there's never been a window ever in the history of mankind that I know of that a nurse traveling or otherwise could make six or $700,000 in one year. But I had three of them this year do their debt-free screams on the show, paid off everything, went from almost bankrupt to millionaire in one year. Work is a powerful thing, especially when you got something like that you can do. Pretty stinking good extra job, you know. 
far as the mathematics. Now, I don't have any idea about the medical part, and I bless their hearts for being incredibly brave. I don't, I don't know what I would have done because I'm pretty much a, a wuss when it comes to stuff like that. The third thing, when you get yourself out of debt and you get on a plan, is be outrageously generous. Live with an open hand. Even a dog understands this. Come here, baby. You do this, the dog goes, whoa! Human beings, this is an open spirit. This is a spirit of abundance. This is a spirit of scarcity. Live with an open hand. You can't take it with you anyway. I never saw a router truck fall on a hearse. So, you know, live with an open hand. Live like no one else. Pay a price to win so that you can live and give like no one else. Now, don't be irresponsible. Be wise. And don't give drug dealers money to be better drug dealers. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about being a child with your generosity. Be wise. Be an adult with your generosity. But you know what you can do with $1,000? You can buy a single mom a car. It changes her life. You know what you can do with $10,000? You can do that 10 times. You know where you get $10,000? You don't have a car payment anymore. And magically, about three years later, you're going to start to have money if you keep working. It's the most amazing thing. It sets you in a position to be unbelievably generous. Live with an open hand. It's really about all this is good for. It's taking care of your family and taking care of others. It's not good for my chest. I mean, it's okay to have some nice things. I'm not against that. But if you eat enough lobster, it tastes like soap. <laughs> There's only so much you can do of nice stuff, and it starts to run out. You know what I'm saying? It starts to be all of a sudden it's not nice anymore. It's not fun after a while. But generosity never gets old. Your heart is designed to be a giver because God's a giver and you're made in his image. Here is what I want you to do. I want you to get yourself together so that you can start being crazy with money. And I want you on Thanksgiving, if you're going to grandma's house to eat, I want you to get up a little bit early and on the way to grandma's house, whether you're going out of town or across town or whatever you're doing, load the kids in the car and, and budget an extra 30 minutes and on the way over there, I want you to pull up at Waffle House. Now, some of you poor souls across the world don't know what Waffle House is. <laughs> you have been withheld from the finer things in life. But it is a fast, what do you call them, fast cooking, whatever you do, the quick, fa it's, not, it's, not a fast, it's not fast food, but it's a chef that cooks quick in front of you, whatever they're, a cook that cooks, it's not a chef, it's a cook. And so they'll cook it right in front of you on the griddle right there, and it comes really quick, and it's usually greasy. And it's waffles or eggs, and it's almost always greasy, and everything's greasy. The orange juice is greasy. <laughs> it's good. So I, I, I want you to go to Waffle House on Thanksgiving morning. I want you to pull up right in front of the big window. They have these big windows across the front where you can see inside. Get the parking spot right in front. And I want you to leave the kids in the car. You can leave your spouse in the car. You can even leave it running because it might be cold. Go inside, sit at the little bar. They got a little eating bar up there. And I want you to order a cup of coffee. You're not even going to drink the coffee. It's greasy. <laughs> and I, I want you to order a cup of coffee. And I, I, I want you to slip three $100 bills or four $100 bills under that cup. Walk outside. Because you know who's working in Waffle House? Somebody needs a job bad. You know who's working in Waffle House on Thanksgiving morning? Somebody that life has been tough for lately. It's been tough on her. Go out to the car and tell the kids, get off the screens. Look, watch through the window right here. God's getting ready to show off. Watch through this window right here, kids. Everybody watch. Here's what she'll do. I've seen her do it. She'll come over and she'll pick it up. And she'll go. Now that is kind of funny. Until you think about that her life has been so bad that she thinks this is a trick.
Then she'll go. Hmm. And then even if she's not a person of faith, she can smell God's breath. Because that's who sent it when you brought it. And even if she hadn't been in church in her life or she was there Sunday or she used to go and somebody made her mad or hurt her feelings, doesn't matter what her story is, she still knows the smell. And after she does this, she's going to go, thank you. Thank you. And then she'll do a little Snoopy dance. Right? Let your kids watch that happen all through their growing up years. And we'll have a nation that has been changed. You teach your children generosity like that. You teach them what money's good for. And you teach them how to get some money and how to stay out of the traps of these dadgum stinking banks. And you teach them how to live on a written plan. And you say, as of my house, as of right now, the name Ramsey does not mean broke anymore. From this point on, a godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. As it stops here, I'm going to change my family tree. And if enough of us do that, and we teach our kids outrageous generosity, we can heal this land. They don't have the answers in the places where you think they have the answers, and you keep voting, waiting on one of them to grow a brain. <laughs> you got the answers. You felt it just now, didn't you? When we all do this, we can put them out of business. We can make them irrelevant, because you know what will happen with hungry kids? Hungry kids will get fed by us. You know what will happen with single moms? 52% of them live below the poverty level. We'll be taking care of them. You know what will happen when somebody loses their life in the military? A hundred percent of the time, the community will come around and take care of that family the rest of their life. We won't need VA benefits. You know what I'm saying? That's what generosity does. But you know what generosity coming from broke people is? No money. So you've got to stop being broke people first. We have to make a decision to change. Hope is what we want you to walk away from here with. This stuff works. I've taught millions and millions and millions of people how to get out of debt, how to get on a written plan so that they can change their family tree, so that we can be outrageously generous and change everything. You can create goals like George taught you, create priorities like Christy taught you, and you see how this weaves into being on a budget, getting out of debt, so that we can change our family tree, so that we can be outrageously generous. It's entirely mathematically possible, but I gotta control this guy in the mirror. And he's just that guy sometimes. It's okay. Nobody's gonna be perfect at it, but we're all gonna get better. See, we started teaching a class about, gosh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago now. And I used to teach it with an overhead projector and a bad suit, you know. And then we put it on these tapes. Some of y'all old enough remember VHS tapes. We put it on those. And then we put it on DVDs. And now we've got this thing called the Internet. And, <laughs> and so you can get the thing anywhere. Now, it's called Financial Peace University. Almost 10 million people have been through the class. That means that more people have been taught by this class how to handle money than any other thing in existence today on the planet. Okay? That's not bragging. It's just a mathematical fact. And we teach people how to get out of debt, how to be married with money, how to be single with money, how to invest with confidence, how to handle their insurance, how to buy real estate and not get ripped off. It's the class you should have been made to take in high school, but nobody knew how to teach it because the teachers were broke too. But I'm not broke anymore. I've done a lot of dumb things. But the stuff we teach is proven. Now, you may or may not do it. You may ish instead of do it completely. And ish is a wish. You've got to do it completely. But if you'll do exactly what we teach you to do, the stuff I'm talking about will happen for you. It's happened for me and it's happened for millions of other people. Just look up debt-free screams on YouTube. How many of them there are? It's a bazillion of them. 
That's one of the biggest things on YouTube. Little old us, down here in Tennessee, with a southern accent, which is supposed to lower your intelligence. <laughs> the second thing that we know is that the most important thing you got to do if you're going to learn to handle money well is get on a written plan, a budget. Y'all heard that, didn't you say yes? Yeah. And the, we built the most powerful, most robust, that's what the internet guys call it, uh, budgeting app on the planet. The best one, without a doubt, not even a close second, in quality, in delivery, in doing the stuff that we teach, doing the steps that we teach, walking the process is called Every Dollar. The premium version of Every Dollar links to your bank account, so when you use your debit card, it automatically loads into your budget. Okay, so Financial Peace University and every dollar and then put with that a coach, an online coach that'll be there for you to answer your questions. Put with that that you're in a community, you can go to a class in physical locations if you want and or you can just take it online but there's an online community and you know what the online community does, they will bust your chops if you're not doing it. They will love you enough to say that's stupid, don't do that, they will kill you. They say stuff like that. Now, I'll never, I've never killed anybody, but I have a reputation apparently. So apparently it's a possibility. I don't know. But, um, but, but um, I'm kidding. But I mean, we, we want you to win and we want to encourage you and hold you accountable to the system that works. So if you hire a personal trainer and you come in and he has an eight pack and you have a keg, you should do what he says, not your plan. Your plan sucks. You should do the other guy's plan. It works. Isn't that simple? But we don't do it. We all, no, I'm going to sort of do that, but I don't know if I agree with, well, you're dumb. You're not doing it. Why are you, why'd you hire him? My wife says, if you're not going to do what the guy says, you're just paying him to count to 10. It's kind of expensive, you know? <laughs> you got to do the whole thing, the nutrition and the exercise. You can't exercise enough to eat seven Big Macs. It just doesn't. You can't outrun a Big Mac. <laughs> Same thing's true with money, right? You submit yourself to this process, and it works every single time. So the premium version of every dollar, the coaching online, all of this is part of now of a Ramsey Plus membership. And, and the easiest way, the least, most, least expensive way to do that is just do a year membership on the thing. And here's what we're going to do, too. Tonight, we're going to throw in Christie's new book, Take Back Your Time, okay? And you can either get the audio book if you prefer, or we will ship you the hardback version, whichever one you want. You can choose to select when you go to the, the gameplanbundle.com and select everything that's going on. So here's the deal. All of that together is $149 normal pricing, and we're going to put the lowest price on it we've put this year because America needs a game plan. It's time for us to change. And we're going to do the whole thing for 99 bucks right now. And you spent that on pizza! I don't need the money, but I also know that if, you, if I gave it to you for free, you probably wouldn't do it. Pay just a little bit, you're like, I got to do this stuff. I paid money for it, so I'm going to hold you accountable, and uh, that gives me the money to pay that single mom that works here too, by the way, so this is how this whole thing works. It's a trade-out, and uh, we're, we're very happy with that trade. Gameplanbundle.com, that's where you go, and it's the best deal that we've done in the last 14 months. So 99 bucks, and it includes Christie's book, which is the number one bestseller. Again, we just got that word today, and we're very, very proud of her on that. So it works out this way. I got obsessed with Ancestry.com because I wanted to look up all of my, the noble hillbilly heritage of the Ramses. <laughs> and it is a noble heritage. I mean, we've got all kinds of characters in there, a bunch of preachers in there, and I just would love to go back and meet some of those guys. You know, you know, musket carrying people coming across the North Carolina border into what became Tennessee later. You know, who are these men? Who are these women that, do, you know, that, that lived on hunted bear? And, and I mean, I just, it's amazing to me. And one of my, my grandmother's grandfather was a circuit riding preacher. He was in the Union Army. He was, he was a Yankee and um, Methodist boy. And he decided after the war to come south and preach to the Southerners. So he came south as a circuit riding preacher, and I've got his Bible from 1876. Pretty cool. And, the, the, and I've got a lot of stories about him. He's a wonderful character of a man. I mean, that's pretty brave to be a Yankee come south and preach. He's a lot of stuff that people didn't like right then, okay? And so you, you are meddling at no end. I, I, I would love to hear the stuff he went through, but I'll, I'll hear it in heaven. 
And so I was talking to my cousin. I said, I've been looking at all these people. I'm building out the family tree and everything. He goes, yeah, I got a bunch of them. We started comparing notes. And he said, you know, they're buried right over there in Maryville by, by your grandpa. And I said, really? And he told me where the stone was and everything. So next time I was down there in East Tennessee, we rode, rode down to the thing. And I went back there to find, because I thought, I'm just enamored with the thing. I wanted to find his gravestone. So I found his gravestone. And sure enough, there it was. The date he was born and the date he died. And that's true on every one of them, isn't it? And there's that thing in the middle, the dash, and that's where it all happened. That's where the action took place. So my challenge for you is what are you going to do with your dash? You got one shot at it. What are you going to do? Change. I've had it. I'm not living like this anymore. I'm going to change this. So three generations from now, some little character is wandering through a graveyard looking for my gravestone because I left a mark on history. What are you going to do with your family tree? Are you going to leave a mark on it? What are you going to do with your dash? It's an honor to be with you all tonight. I love you. God bless you. Thank you.